Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 11. We are continuing through the action packed Gospel of Mark on the mighty miracles of Jesus. Mark, chapter number 11, we will begin our text this morning at verse number 12. If you found it, would you say amen? Mark chapter 11, verse number 12. Now the next day, when they had come out of Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, the fig tree, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then Jesus taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. Scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening was come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, Whosoever says to this mountain, Be removed and cast into the sea, And does not doubt in his heart, But believes that those things he says will be done, He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the ministry of his word. Amen. We have looked at so many miracles through the gospel of Mark. We have seen Jesus heal those that are deaf and mute. Heal the blind, heal the lame, raise the dead, cause a woman's issue of blood to dry up. We have seen so many miracles and you look at almost all of the miracles and it is transformational to somebody's life when Jesus does that miracle. There are some of the miracles that are not necessarily miracles to people, but they're miracles that show Jesus' power over all of nature. You see Jesus feeding the multitudes with just a handful of food. You see Jesus walking on the water. You see Jesus commanding the storm to calm. And, 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 but, but, but of all of the miracles in the Gospel of Mark, when I get to this miracle... At first reading, it's almost annoying. 
of all the things that Jesus could use his miracle working power on, he curses a fig tree and causes it to dry up from the roots. What is the point in this miracle? It almost seems like a wasted miracle. Jesus, instead of speaking to the tree and making a tree die, why don't you speak to a lame man and have him get up and walk or speak to a dead person and have them raised from the... Why, why this miracle? But every miracle has a meaning. There is a message in every miracle. And as I look at this and I ponder this text, I want to bring out a few things that have come from just really thinking on this verse. It says that Jesus came to this fig tree when he was hungry. Now, there are symbolic uses of the fig tree in the minor prophets of the Old Testament where the fig tree represents Israel, the people of God. And in, 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 in like manner, it would represent spiritual Israel, the church. And Jesus came to this tree. But the tree didn't have any figs. Now figs, that's kind of a weird thing for us. We're not used to figs. The only figs I know about have come in a Newton. Have any of you ever eaten a fig that wasn't in a Newton? Fig Newtons are all that I know of figs. If you put a group of figs up in front of me on, 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 on the altar this morning, I couldn't pick it out from the lineup. I don't know what a fig looks like unless it's wrapped up in a Newton. But figs are a very common fruit in the Middle East. And Jesus came to this tree hungry and it didn't have any fruit. There comes a time when the Lord visits a person, a church, a family, or a nation. There comes a moment when God shows up. We call it revival. We call it a move of God. But when the moment of our visitation comes, we must be prepared and be ready. You see, the challenge is when God shows up and we have not made ourselves ready for the presence of the Lord. Jesus came and He visited this fig tree and it wasn't ready. I wonder if the Lord were to come with a visitation, if we have prepared ourselves and we have made ourselves ready for the move of God, for the visitation of the Lord. you got to get ready. I've heard folks say, I'm praying for a husband. And if somebody shows up at single, they're like, now I'm going to start to work out. I'm going to lose me 50 pounds. I'm going to get in shape. It's too late. Go ahead and put on that size 14 dress. Get your hair done and do the best you you got to get ready for what you're praying for. If God shows up and we've been relaxed and haven't made ourselves ready. You see, when the Lord shows up, well, you know, I, I, I look at this passage and I think of a, probably the verse in Scripture that haunts me and makes me just 
examine myself and really with reverential fear look at what am I doing? This verse where Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. Jesus had blessed this fig tree with sunshine, with good soil. He had blessed it with rain that came down from heaven and dew that covered the earth. He had been good to this fig tree. He had provided for it. But it didn't provide for him. If God shows up and he, and, he, and he does an examination of our life, is there fruit? Or do we just have leaves? Do we have spiritual fruit? Or do we just have the dressing of fig leaves? Fig leaves have been a problem for mankind for a long time. You remember in the book of Genesis, the first three trees that are mentioned in Scripture, there's a tree of life, there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then the third tree that's mentioned is a fig tree. And it says that after Adam and Eve sinned. They went and they got fig leaves and they sewed it together and they covered themselves because they knew they were naked. Fig leaves are the problem where we try to cover our sin instead of getting right with God. Fig leaves are man's approach to hiding sin instead of getting rid of sin and getting right with God. And God said, no, fig leaves aren't going to do. There's only one way to get rid of sin. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And the Bible said that God covered them with animal skins. God performed the first sacrifice as a sign of the lamb that would be slain, that would cover and take away the sin of the world and God covered them and said your fig leaves won't do there has to be blood to get rid of the sin problem Amen. and Jesus came to this fig tree and he saw only leaves no fruit if God visits us does he see leaves of religion or fruit of righteousness. If God's, if, if, if Jesus shows up and examines our life, our tree, are there leaves of religious activity? Or is there spiritual fruit? It says he found nothing but leaves. But then I find this next phrase very puzzling. Because it says it was not the season of figs. Well, it wasn't time. It wasn't the season so the tree had a good excuse. We love excuses, don't we? Amen. <laughs> Lord, this isn't my season. But when God shows up, we need to have fruit. I'm just going through something, Lord. Maybe God visits when we're not expecting it. That tree could have said, that wasn't right. What that preacher said to me, he knows I'm going through a bad season. But when the Lord shows up, it's time. It was not the season of figs. And it says that Jesus spoke. 
and said it's done. No one will eat fruit from you <coughs> ever again. What judgment? What finality when Ichabod is written over the door, when judgment is pronounced, when God runs out of patience, when the gavel falls, when it is no more chances. It was God's time. The Lord showed up. It was the hour of the visitation from the Master. And they weren't ready. After that it says Jesus came to Jerusalem. We know this story. And this is probably the story that is most out of character with the American plastic Jesus. That we want to have in, 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 in our religion. We show a meek and a mild Jesus. We talk about the sweet master. But this Jesus went into the temple, took a whip. I haven't tried this, but as a pastor, I don't think it's real popular when you take a whip to the church folks. He took a whip. And... It says he began to drive people out. This wasn't really a good church growth plan. Did y'all hear about that preacher down in Little Leatherwood? He's got a whip chasing people off. He began to drive them out. Now, it says he, he drove out the money changers. They had a racket going on. So, all the coins that you would use in your day-to-day -day life were Roman coins. You remember the um, Pharisee that tried to trick Jesus and they, they said, should we um, pay tax? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said, bring me a coin. Who's, who, whose picture's on this? Well, it's Caesar. And he said, render to Caesar what Caesar's. So, their coins had... A picture, an inscription from Rome, from Caesar on it. But the rabbis taught that that was foreign, unholy money. So if you're going to go and buy a sacrifice at the temple, you had to take your filthy Roman money and change it to holy Jewish money and then go and buy your sacrifice with it. And they were and they were gouging folks in the exchange of the coins. They had a business set up where church was all about making money. It was about pulling in dollars. I don't know, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on under the name of Christianity that is not the Christ of the Bible. Jesus said the foxes have holes and the Birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. But if you tune into a lot of American preaching, you'd think God's all about dollars and cents. Send me a hundred and God will give you ten thousand. Send in a thousand dollar vow and God will give you a pink Cadillac. It's over and over. Would to God 
That we have the Spirit of Christ come to the church in America with the whip to drive the money changers out because Jesus said, this isn't, this is a den of thieves. There's nothing in church but a bunch of pickpockets and you guys disgrace the cross of Jesus Christ and the heavenly treasure of eternal life by making it about nothing more than the American dream and dollars and, and money and stuff. Jesus said, you've made it a den of thieves. But li listen to what he said. Because this is so defining in what the church must be. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. It's so easy for us to get involved in all kinds of activities at church and there's nothing wrong with lots of activities. But if this is going to be his house, it will be because it's a house of prayer. He said, my house. If we want Jesus to say, this is my house then we need to make it a house of prayer. If you want your home to be a place that he would call his house, then you need to make it a house of prayer. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And I wonder as I read this, if the reason that, 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 that maybe the last generation, the generation before saw God move and saw mighty miracles and saw the presence of the Lord, it was because they were people of prayer. They said, we may not be able to do everything. We may not have the nicest of facilities, but we will be people of prayer prayer. My house will be a house of prayer. God, help us to make this a house of prayer. Amen. The next day, it says, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered up from the roots. The next day. Jesus spoke to it. And the next day. It was withered up. And dead. Hear me. Judgment. And the wrath of God is not a long, drawn-out process. When you look and see in Scripture when God sends judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, in one night they're destroyed. In Noah, in one day, the whole earth is drowned. When judgment comes, it is fierce, it is final, it is sudden. The next day, it was withered up from the roots. And Peter said, look, Lord, the tree you cursed <coughs> is withered away. And Jesus uses this as a moment to teach us about three things. Faith, prayer, and forgiveness. First, Jesus says, have faith in God. You know, I think that the longer you live, the more difficult it can be to have faith. Kids are often able to have faith because they haven't learned how impossible things are. I remember 
we had a, a, an, an incident where Solomon had a, a, a pencil and he, he fell with it and it punctured the roof of his mouth. And so we were in the process of gathering up all the kids, applying a little pressure to it and getting ready to take them to the ER. And Abby decided to pray. She prayed for him. We didn't even much pay attention to it until we looked as we're getting ready to load everybody up. And the hole is gone. There's no scar. There's no blood. There's no sign that anything happened. She had this childlike faith that said, I'm going to ask Jesus to do it and believed that he would. Hebrews says, those that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Somehow, we've got to overcome all of the unbelief and all of the impossibilities that we have come to believe in our mind that limit our ability to believe God. <coughs> Jesus said, have faith in God. He said, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. Mountain moving faith. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. There's something about prayer and the Holy Spirit that are involved in helping us to increase and to strengthen our faith. Jude says, Beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. There is something about praying in the Spirit that allows us to strengthen our faith. This is one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit was sent. Because He knows that we've got all these problems. We've got all these weaknesses. We've got all these troubles. And we need the Holy Spirit to build up and to strengthen our faith. And Paul says that when we don't, the Spirit also helps with our infirmities, our weaknesses. For when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit Himself intercedes and prays with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit helps us to build up our faith. So sometimes if you can't believe God for what you know in your mind that you need to pray, pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit will strengthen your faith. And the Spirit will give you the ability to believe God. Because if we can get to that place where we really believe God and we don't doubt in our heart and we know if we're praying for somebody that's sick, we know that God is a healer. If we're praying for a financial miracle, we know that God is a provider. If we're praying for salvation, we know that He is a Savior. If we're praying for somebody that's bound in addiction, we know that God is a deliverer. Because Jesus said, if you will say it and not doubt in your heart. If you can get to the place where you've prayed until you have faith and you prayed in the Holy Ghost until you believe God. Jesus said, have faith in God and you can say, you can look at this mountain. You can look at this fig tree. You can look at that uh, that, that, that lost loved one. You can look at that sickness and you can say and if you don't doubt in your heart, Jesus said whatever you say, you will have. Believes that those things he says will be done. He will have Whatever he says. It's faith. But here's the challenge. Is when we don't have the right faith. We don't pray in the Holy Ghost until we get faith. It's what the old timers used to call 
praying through. You know what? Every time I start to pray, I don't have the right level of faith. I've got some doubt. But don't let that keep you away from the presence of the Lord. Because if you'll pray and you'll get in the presence of the Lord, and you'll allow the Holy Spirit to pray, then God will give you a breakthrough where you're able to have faith, and you're able to believe God, and you've prayed until you say, you know what, I used to have doubt, but I'm laying it aside, and now I believe God. I've prayed, and now I've got faith to believe for that miracle. (coughs) Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. See, this is where prayer in the Holy Ghost and sometimes if you still can't believe, then get somebody that has faith to pray for you. And join your faith with their faith. And allow God to give you a breakthrough in your faith. Because faith can be contagious. Unbelief can be contagious. Jesus, on some of the miracles He did, He put out Folks, remember when he raised Jairus' daughter? He put everybody out except for Jairus, the girl's mom, and Peter, James, and John. Unbelief can be contagious. You've got to be careful what voices you listen to. Because there are folks that will talk you out of believing. They'll talk you out of your miracle. They'll talk you out of, well, I don't know. Well, don't get too excited. Well, that'll wear off. Well, be careful. And all of a sudden, the faith that you were believing God for, the what you were standing in faith for, you've allowed voices of unbelief. You've allowed doubt to settle into your heart. And so now you're even questioning, did God touch me? Did I get a miracle? Am I saved? Is there a God? And all of a sudden, unbelief has filled your mind and your heart. But Jesus said, if you will believe. So whatever you've got to do to believe, whether it's putting voice aside, setting folks out and getting with people that say you know what, let's believe God together. I don't know, everybody else might say it's impossible, but we're going to join together and believe God. It might be impossible but with God, all things are possible to them that believe. Amen. Amen. And then Jesus said, while you're praying examine your heart. And see if there's anybody that you have unforgiveness toward. In addition to unbelief keeping us from receiving from the Lord, unforgiveness blocks us from receiving. It's easy to carry bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. I was telling Wanda, because of what she went through, that a few months ago I got hit by a guy with a hit and run. He rear-ended us, scooted off. I got his license plate number, but the guy had a stolen plate. I had some neck pain. He was probably going 25 miles an hour when he rear-ended us. And I was angry. We had a guy, we had a a, a tree stump in 
in our yard that um, we had a tree that had died, and so we had the tree taken down, but um, a guy came through the neighborhood that was um, doing some yard work. He said he had a stump grinder. So Pam paid him 80 bucks, and a guy never did grind up that stump. I called him. Yeah, I'll be there next Saturday. I don't know how many times. I got so mad. Spitfire mad at that guy. There's other wounds. If you've been in church any time, you've definitely gotten hurt. Sometimes it's because people are mean and ornery. Sometimes they don't even realize what they did. I've offended folks and not even realized it. You get busy on a service and you, you, you end up not getting to shake everybody's hand. You never know. Some folks get offended. Jesus said when you're praying, Look in your heart. See if you've got unforgiveness. First Peter says that if you've got unforgiveness with your spouse, that it keeps your prayers from being answered. Jesus said, when you're at the altar praying, search your heart. If you've got unforgiveness toward anybody, you've got to forgive them to receive forgiveness from the Lord. You know, as much as we feel justified in our anger and our unforgiveness, Jesus told this parable of a guy that owed a million bucks. The king forgave him. Let him go. It was a time when if you had debt to somebody, they could actually have you put in debtor's prison So you work off the debt. But the king was gracious. Let the guy go. Until he hears that this guy goes out and finds somebody that owes him 20, grabs him by the neck and threatens to throw him in prison. And when you look at what people may have done to us, it's so puny compared to what we've done that the Lord forgave us for. And Jesus said, if we're going to be forgiven, we've got to forgive. It's hard to forgive but it's even harder to live with unforgiveness. You may have real reasons that you have anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. Someone may have really wronged you. But they you, you, you keep hurting yourself the longer that you hold on to it. Instead of saying, Lord... I'm letting this go. Help me to forgive. Help me, Lord. Give me the power to really forgive them. Jesus says, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. It's not worth going to hell over what somebody did to you. Having the right to stay mad at them. Keeping bitterness in your heart. Let it go. Well, you don't know how many times they've done. Peter thought, well, Lord, you know, I can forgive, but how many? Because I got this one guy. He's wronged me at least a dozen times. Tell me when he's done me 13, I'm good to go. I can go back at him. 
I can get even. And Jesus said, every day, you got to forgive that sucker 70 times 7. That run my patience a little thin, Lord. The only way you can do that is to get God kind of forgiveness in our heart. Because we've done way more to the Lord. And He's so gracious and so forgiving and so merciful and so compassionate that when we get God's heart in us we can forgive even those who continue in wronging us. Jesus said, but if you do not forgive see prayer answered prayer one, we've got to be people of prayer we have to have faith and we have to have forgiveness. That when we have faith and when we have forgiveness that the Lord will begin to answer our prayer. What are we praying for? What are you praying for? What are you really asking God to do? What's the big miracles that you're saying? God, Please, save my son. God, do this. When we get faith and forgiveness right, that we can even tell a mountain what it'll do and it'll obey when we get faith and forgiveness. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we close this morning. Father, I come to you today, Lord, and I'm asking God for your strength and your help. That you'd give us the power to forgive, Lord. That, Lord, you would help us, Lord, with all of these struggles that we've got with unforgiveness.